All right, the next topic I want to cover is to provide an overview of Java atomic operations and variables. And this is very important because it relates to a portion of your assignment 1B code. And it has to do with spin locks and reentrant spin locks and so on. So what we're going to talk about are the Java programming language features and library features, class library features that provide atomic operations and variables. Before we do that, though, we have to kind of motivate what the heck this is all about, right? Why do we need to have atomicity in the first place? So the kind of the dictionary definition of atomic actions means that changes to a field are always consistent and visible to other threads. That's the key concept of atomicity. You can take a look here to read more about atomicity in the context of Java. There's a nice <clears throat> tutorial that explains it. An atomic action is one that either happens all at once or doesn't happen at all. We've talked about that before. For some somewhat odd reason, this is also known as linearizability, which I think is a strange way to say it, uh, but that's what it's often called. So basically, you can't stop in the middle and leave things inconsistent, because otherwise, you know, chaos and insanity will break out, like your transporter example. Any side effect of an atomic action is not visible to other threads until the action completes in its entirety. So it's all or nothing, right? So not half-baked, half half-done. There are three typical concepts that are associated with atomic actions in Java. And if you read this article, it's got a great summary of what I'm about to cover. First issue is atomicity. And that deals with which actions and sets of actions have indivisible effects or atomic effects. And here's a simple example to illustrate this point. This is a intentionally buggy, and this is intentionally defective. So we have non-atomic ops, that's the name of this class. It has a counter that's a long, and we have two methods, increment and decrement. And as you can see, uh, increment is starting and just counting upwards forever, and decrement is going forever and counting downwards. So there's going to be sort of this battle between, you know, incrementing and decrementing. And we're going to run increment in thread T2, and we're going to run decrement in thread T1. And the question is, what will the result be if we were to run this for a while? And the answer is, who the heck knows, right? Because the act of incrementing a non-atomic field, like counter, is undefined. There's no, no telling what the value will be. It might be just random garbage. It might be something useful. It's probably not going to be something consistent, that's for sure. It's certainly not predictable. And that's because there's no way to ensure exclusive atomic access to this thing. Plus, plus, even though plus, plus, and minus, minus appear syntactically to be indivisible, in reality, they're actually incrementing things. You know, it's moving memory, it's moving the value of something from memory into a register. It's incrementing or decrementing said value in said register. It's writing said incremented or decremented value back to memory. And there's all kinds of opportunities for overleaving and caching and um, interleaving and all kinds of gobbledygook. So this will just give you bizarre results. So this code is not atomic. The next topic seems related, is related, but it's different. Visibility. And this is the, what determines when the effects of one thread can be seen by another thread. So this is a wacky example. So here we have a class called loop may never end, and that kind of gives you a Hink, a, uh, an inkling of what the problem is. So we have a variable called done, which we set to false. And we have thread t1, which is going to call work. And it's going to sit here while the variable's not done, right? So well, this has not been set to true. It's going to do stuff. And down here, we're going to have another method called stop work, which will assume thread t1 will call at some point. And so it's going to set done to true. And the question is, will this program ever terminate? And the answer is, we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because this code here has no synchronization around it. So it's possible that this thread could be reading a cached copy of done, and this thread could be writing to a cached copy of done, and the cached copy in thread T1 might actually never percolate over to here. Probably will at some point when something else happens. But there's nothing in the language, uh, there's no, no semantics that will ensure that this happens unless we do some other stuff. And we'll talk about what the other stuff is. 
So visibility is important. This code may never stop running, even though we're sitting there setting done to true. And that's because it never leaves the cache in which it's being set. The third topic is ordering. And ordering determines when actions in one thread occur out of order with respect to another thread. And uh, this, is, this class is called badly ordered. And we have two variables, A and B. We set them both to false. They're Boolean. And then method one, which is running in thread T1, sets both to true, one after another. And then method T2, which is running in thread, I'm sorry, method two in thread T2, has a bunch of uh, Boolean assignments and then a comparison. And the question is, what will the results be here? And the answer is, who the heck knows? Uh, and that's, again, because these things are not properly synchronized, and so they're not atomic. So it might be that, uh, for various reasons having to do with the weakly ordered memory semantics, it might be that uh, thread 2 will see B have the value of true, but A might have the value of false, even though A and B occurred in the order A equal true, B equal true. It might be the case that the memory gets propagated to the other thread in some other order. Moreover, after we read A the first time and see false, we might read it again a second time, and now it'll be true, even though we've done absolutely nothing whatsoever to A. And then, you know, who the heck knows what this is going to be, because these things may have all kinds of strange values. So that's what ordering is. Ordering says, what's the order in which things occur? Well, if you aren't careful and you don't define your code properly, then we don't know what the order is going to be. And so, of course, synchronization is, comes to the rescue for all that. Let's talk a little bit about atomic variables. This is now we're really starting to move into the next programming assignment. So Java supports several types of atomic actions. One type is something called a volatile variable. And uh, this is funny because there's also the concept of a volatile in C and C++, which is nothing at all like volatile in Java. Common source of confusion. Great question if you're interviewing someone for a job and they claim to know C++ and C and Java. You can trip them up almost assuredly by asking them to explain the difference between volatile in the different languages. So in Java, what that means is that a variable is read from and written to main memory, not what's in the processor cache. So in particular, here's, here's typically how things are organized in a modern memory hierarchy. You've got main memory, and then each thread or each uh, core has its own cache. Typically, each core has its own cache. And so what's happening here is that this thread might go ahead and write the value 13 to the volatile, if this is marked as volatile, that will write through the cache to main memory, such that when this guy reads from variable v, it will get the value 13. In contrast, if you write to a non-volatile location, then it may take a while or forever for the data to get propagated to the other caches. So essentially, volatile means atomic read and write of the value. Here's a simple example. It's a ping pong example that alternates printing ping and pong between two threads. If you take a look at this article here, it explains how this code works. Basically, what we're going to do here, we're going to have two threads, one of which is going to do um, ping. So what it's going to do is we start out with a value, which equals 0, and we run this a certain number of max times. And this thread, which is the changer thread, is going to loop for uh, LV equal val, which is 0, until value is equal to max. And what it's going to do every time is it's going to increment the value of LV and update val <laughs> by 1, and then it'll write ping and go to sleep for half a second. This thread wakes up, and it's just going to sit here and spin, and it's going to wait until LV doesn't equal val. And whenever that's the case, it'll print the value, and then it'll set LV to the value. So if you properly make val volatile, this program will work correctly, because it's going to have these atomic changes to the state. If you remove volatile, then there's no assurance that this program will even ever terminate, because these values may not be updated at all relative to each other. So putting volatile means that the value gets propagated through to memory, such that when the other one reads it, it'll have the latest value. There's also a whole pile of atomic operations in the Java unsafe class. Now we're really starting to get into what you're supposed to do. Um, oddly enough, the unsafe class in earlier versions of Java 
was only designed for the Java class library, not for normal programs like the stuff that you and I write. Um, there's a bunch of really cool methods in there, things like compare and swap, and that's what all the other parts of Java concurrency is ultimately, or ultimately based on, is these compare and swap methods. You can read more about compare and swap here. Here's basically what compare and swap does. Here, here's the interface. Compare and swap int, say. What that does is that takes some Java object, some offset into that Java object, the value that's expected at that offset, and the value we want to set it to. And the way it works is the following. We have an atomic region. This is sort of C-like pseudocode, so it's not really meant to be Java, but it's kind of what happens under the hood if you were to look at this. What we're going to do is we're going to offset into the object, which of course you can't do in normal Java. We're going to read into the object a certain number of bytes into it, get the old value. If the old value equals what we expect, then we're going to update atomically the portion of that object at the offset location to the updated value. And then we return the old value. And so what this does is it's compare and swap. And if they're equal, and if and only if they're equal, then we update it. Otherwise, we don't. So what the heck could you use that for? Well, you can use this in order to implement what are called lock-free algorithms. And lock-free algorithms basically mean that you're not blocking. So they're just going to spin. They never block. And there's a whole bunch of reasons to do that. Here's a simple example of a mutex spin lock implemented with the compare and swap int operation. So lock, you give an object and an offset. And while compare and swap returns uh, false, this should say a return old value. Um, this is basically checking to see whether or not it's changed. So while compare and swap returns false, or sorry, while it returns true, we're going to keep spinning. And what that's trying to do is it's saying, uh, basically, wait until the value is unlocked and set it to lock. So unlocked is 0, locked is 1. And so what it keeps trying to do is it says, while we haven't actually, uh, sorry, while the thing is currently busy, keep spinning. And only when we become the owner will we allow it to uh, to finish. And then likewise, unlock simply will go ahead and set the value to zero. So that says now it's available. So that's the basic concept of compare and swap, and you'll see why that's important in a second. Java also provides a bunch of atomic classes, so it includes a class like atomic boolean. And these classes, atomic boolean, atomic int, atomic long, atomic reference, they all use this Java unsafe class and its compare and swap methods in order to implement lock-free algorithms. So here's atomic boolean, how it works. It's really interesting. What it does is it, you have a class, atomic boolean, which you've got to use, uh, or some of you have to use, and we go ahead and say, hey, please go and find the offset in bytes of the field in this class called value. So here's the value field. This is going to find out how many bytes it is from the beginning of the class. It'll probably be at location you know, zero, uh, offset zero, because it's the first uh, non-static field in the class. So, but whatever it is, we, we stash that away. And note that the value is volatile. And that means that it can be assigned to atomically. That's important for, to see what's about to happen. The compare and set method, which is very similar to compare and swap, in fact, it uses it under the hood as the implementation, is used to try to set one value to another. So we have the expected value, like say, false, and we have the update value, say, true, which is a way of saying, I want to lock this thing. And under the hood, this algorithm uses compare and swap int. So what it does is it creates an int to see whether or not uh, expect is you know, true or false, and then what it does is it will call compare and swap int. And what that's saying is only change the value of the Boolean to update if its current value is what we expect. So what the heck does that have to do with the assignment? Well, if you're writing a lock, a spin lock, what you want to be doing is you want to start out with the lock being available or unlocked, zero, 
false, and then comparing the comparing uh, set operation will let you try to write the value true into the atomic boolean. And if the value is currently true, it's going to fail. Because in that case, what we expect, false, doesn't match what we're trying to update, which is true. So if expect is not false, then this thing will fail. And so your code that you write will have to use this knowledge in order to be able to write the spin lock. So you're basically going to use an atomic boolean. If you're doing the undergrad version, you use the atomic boolean in order to do the spin lock. If you're the grad student version, you have to use an atomic reference. But it's the same basic idea. And then here's how things get set back to their um, whatever value you want. Notice that value is an atomic volatile. So we simply go ahead and give it the appropriate value. OK, so that's the end of the atomic operations and variables overview. You should now have a much better shot at doing a portion of the next assignment.